Hi, thanks for watching. This was a invited talk I did for a, a quantum computing working group at Gartner and their invited guests. This was for an audience who is already familiar with quantum computing and what quantum computers can do, but not very familiar with cryptography or how those two things come together, nor with the market and demand for solutions in this space, which is what um, in part this covers. So this talk is a lot about the current market for cryptography, data protection, and how that interplays now and in the coming years with quantum computers. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I will jump right in. So my name is Patrick Walsh, and I have an extensive background in security and in enterprise cloud applications. I've run threat research labs, I've built intrusion prevention and antivirus systems, and I've designed cryptographic systems. Uh, but full disclosure here, I'll be talking quite a bit about quantum computing, and I am not an expert in the inner workings of quantum computers. To me, a lot of quantum, like the phenom phenomenon of entanglement, is basically indistinguishable from magic. On the cryptography side, I'm not a researcher or a theorist, though I do hold several patents and have published papers on specific topics in cryptography. That said, I am an expert in applied cryptography solutions and bringing them to market and understanding these markets. For the past several years, I've been the CEO of a startup that does exactly this. And just to get this out of the way, because it touches on my credibility here today, Iron Core offers customers a data security platform that protects their sensitive data inside of cloud applications. We sell primarily to technology providers, but are applicable to anyone who entrusts sensitive data to computers managed by other people. We have a lot of capabilities, which I won't get into here, except to say that we support advanced key orchestration and management and data and use encryption. We're very much industry leading in some of the things we're doing. Today, I'll be talking to you first and foremost about how quantum computers are about to disrupt cryptography then about the market for solutions, what's available for uh, today, what the demand for those things is, and what's going to happen tomorrow. I'll talk about where the market actually is and what people want right now. Finally, though I generally prefer interactive talks, because this is packed with info, I'm going to ask everyone to hold questions till the end. I'd encourage you to take notes so all the questions aren't aimed just at the subjects I cover last. So the discussion today will operate at a bunch of different levels. I won't get too deep, but I will need to define some technical concepts and I'll be uh, on and off diving below the surface and then coming back up for context. We'll hit on systems, economics, incentives, markets, and technical problems and drivers. If you're uncomfortable with the level of the discussion, just wait a minute and it'll turn around. All right, here we go. I understand that you already are well-versed in quantum computers. For my purposes, the salient point is that they're theoretically far better than classical computers at very specific types of math. For example, they're well suited for modeling probabilistic systems. They're also not great at all at doing many of the things that our current computers are very good at. They're just a different beast suited to different problems. Unfortunately for us, some of the problems they're theoretically good at solving are ones that we rely on to be hard problems in order to ensure our security. These are the math problems that, when solved, can reverse encryption and lay bare secrets. But before we go on, let me establish some terminology, and I'll give some quick explainers so you can build some intuition for these things if cryptography isn't an area that's already familiar to you. First, a quick explanation of shared secret cryptography, which is also called symmetric cryptography. This is responsible for 99.9% .9 of everything that's encrypted today between you and websites, on disks, etc. The same key encrypts as decrypts, and it's extremely efficient, so the cost to encrypting things with symmetric cryptography is generally negligible. And for the purposes of this talk, it's important to note that data is algorithmically scrambled in a series of steps of combinations, shuffles, and transformations. This family of algorithms are not typically reducible to math equations, although some steps do, of course, involve math. Let me give you some intuition on this. For that uh, reason, imagine your data is a house. If you have the key that by itself can lock and unlock the door, but you want your neighbors, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, to be able to get in to water plants or in case of emergency, then you give each of them a copy of your house key directly and privately. Okay. Now, any of them can unlock your front door. But now suppose you and Charlie get into a big fight over where the fence line is and you no longer want Charlie to have access to your home. Okay, you can ask for the key back, 
but you can't know that Charlie doesn't have a copy. So you get a locksmith to rekey your lock and give you a new key. And then you privately and directly give copies of the new key just to Alice and Bob. Now you can be sure that Charlie can't get into your house, at least using the key that he might have had. And in systems using shared secret cryptography, this is exactly how they work. If the shared secret gets out, you have to re-encrypt the data with a new key. And often you want different keys for different houses to reduce the power a single stolen key can have in a system. Okay, now let's look at the other type of cryptography we'll talk about today, which is called public key cryptography or asymmetric cryptography. It's typically used to agree upon or to securely share symmetric keys. So they get layered together. It's also used to sign things to authenticate them. In public key cryptography, there are two keys, one that's public and used for encrypting, and one that's private and used for decrypting. Or if we're talking about signing, the private key is used for signing and the public key is used for validating the signature. And though you could directly encrypt larger chunks of data using public key cryptography, it's relatively slow, which is why it's far more common to simply encrypt symmetric keys and use them for bigger chunks of data. So in the end, public key cryptography today is primarily used as a way to, to, to securely agree upon and share symmetric keys. So for a more intuitive understanding, let's go back to our data slash house. And this time you have to stretch your imagination a little bit because instead of a single key, you now have a pair of keys and you use one of them to lock your door and the other one to unlock the door. Each of your neighbors also has their own distinct key pairs for their own houses. And they can share their public keys, the ones that can lock the door with you. So you can add locks to your door and seal the door up. They never share the second key, which can be used to unlock things since it works not just on your house, but also on their house. Now, each of them has just one key they have to carry around and they can use it to unlock their own door and your door. Um, uh, but you don't want to necessarily, you know, have mutual sharing access, right? They, they're not offering you the key to their house or anything here in this case. So, you know, in terms of an intuition, you can think of this a little bit like a chain of locks here. I see those multiple locks on the door. You can imagine that only one of them is needed to unlock it, much like with this chain of padlocks. If you can unlock any one of them, you can open up the chain that opens up the gate. And now when you get into a tiff with Charlie, you can just take his lock off the door or his padlock out of the chain, right? And now Charlie can no longer get in your house and you didn't have to go through the expense of rekeying and redistributing keys and all that kind of stuff. Only you, Alice and Bob can get in. Okay, I've already mentioned this, but in practice, now that you understand these two types, you should understand that the public key cryptography is used to often negotiate keys between parties, but specifically when there isn't a secure channel. So we can openly like share our public keys with each other and agree to a secret and anyone can be listening in, but those people won't know what the agreed secret is. So we can now use that secret to do that symmetric encryption. The two most common types of public key cryptography today are called elliptic curve cryptography and RSA which are both math-based and we rely on calculations that are easy to calculate in one direction and basically impossible to calculate in the opposite direction, short of just trying all the possibilities. Shared secrets in practice are used and stored by themselves when someone is protecting their own data and not sharing access to it. So in practice, this is used to secure the data on your phone and to protect the hard drives on your computer or on a cloud server. And as I already said, the shared secret crypto is often used as a component in public key encryption systems, particularly when we're talking about data encryption. The most common algorithm in the family of symmetric cryptography is the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. These specifics will become important, but also if you don't retain that terminology, don't worry about it. Quantum computers impact both of these types of cryptography, which together account for 100% of data protection today or near enough to. A sufficiently powerful quantum computer threatens basically everything, but in different ways and to different degrees. So there are two algorithms. Both were invented in the mid 90s that should make it, this is theory, remember, dramatically easier to attack today's cryptography. The first and the most important of these is called Shor's algorithm. If you have a computer science background, 
if you don't, don't worry about this, but if you have a computer science background, the key takeaway is that it takes a problem that's very hard on classical computers called the prime number factorization problem, and it reduces it from exponential time complexity to logarithmic complexity. Or to put it in more understandable terms, from billions of years to weeks or even less. The other major algorithm is called Grover's algorithm, which probabilistically searches for original inputs to a black box in order to find a match with an output, which is to say, it's a method for brute force attacking keys, but it's faster than what you can do with classical computers. In computer science terms, it takes this from an O of N or linear time, where a classic computer has to try all possible solutions, to an O of square of N attack time. Or to put that in regular terms, it gets way faster, but is still proportional to the size of the input key. And in practice, it means the time to break a key would go from many billions of years to fewer billions of years. Or put in nerdier terms, a 256-bit AES key provides about 128 bits of security against quantum computers, which is still more than adequate for any conceivable secret in terms of how long it would take for someone to break that secret. Shor's algorithm completely breaks RSA, finite field, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, don't worry, I didn't define that and you don't have to know what it is, and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is to say it completely breaks all of our existing widely used public key cryptography, which is responsible for like 100% of secure website connections and way, way, way more in our, in our universe today. Grover's algorithm weakens the security of AES, but as far as we know today, it doesn't really break it at the commonly used key sizes. So that's important because while it's weakened, it's still considered to be quantum computing resistant. Okay, so is cryptography as we know it broken? Short answer is no, not yet, and that's because today quantum computers are babies. They're infants. Regardless of what they may be capable of, someday we can't yet get much sense out of them outside of very basic answers to very basic questions. So to break today's cryptography, a quantum computer has to be able to defeat, for example, a 2048-bit RSA key, which is about 617 decimal digits long. This one on the screen is the actual, it's an actual challenge number for people to try to break. Now that's a very big number by design, so that computers have to take billions of years to break it down. The best anyone has managed to do with a quantum computer and publicly published results is to factor a 16-digit number, and until recently, the largest number factored was the number 21. And in some ways, the factoring of that 16-digit number involved cheating, because instead of purely using Shor's algorithm in a quantum computer, it actually mixed and matched quantum and classic computing to make it happen. So as far as I know, 21, which my grade school daughter could tell you factors to 7 times 3, is still the largest number that's been factored by a quantum computer without help as far as I know, is important, and we'll come back to that later. But why is that? Quantum computers fundamentally are just very hard. There's this superimposition where many possible answers are held together and only one can be extracted, and in the process, it destroys all the other possibilities. But even with that problem solved, there's all this noise. The amount of memory and horsepower of a quantum computer is measured in something called qubits. And today, no publicly discussed quantum computer has anywhere near the number of qubits required to tackle today's cryptography. The second issue is that the, those qubits are somewhat unreliable. It turns out that working with things on quantum scale is really, really, really touchy. Slight vibrations or variations in temperature can screw up everything. And then there are problems of decoherence, which I barely even understand. The result is that extra qubits are needed to guard against errors and to correct for them. So while in a perfect system with none of these problems, cryptography could theoretically be broken with a few thousand qubits. In practice, we have estimates, this is put out by IBM, on the number of qubits required to break 2048-bit RSA. And that number is dropping. So in 2012, they thought it was a billion qubits needed. And in 2019, it was down to 20 million qubits, which is a substantial improvement in terms of what they think is needed. Still nowhere near the couple thousand theoretical perfect amount. But even if that drops down to a million or even 500,000 qubits, we've got a ways to go. So IBM's records on number of qubits stand at 433 
as of November 2022, and they expect it to hit 1,000 qubits this year and 4,000 qubits in 2025, which is incredible progress if it holds, and it probably means that IBM is a decade or so away from breaking RSA 2048. Now, the big subtext here that I've been teasing is that we have no idea what's happening in private government labs in the US and China and elsewhere. It's quite likely that any government secretly building quantum computers is going to keep pretty quiet if they manage to break things and if they have big breakthroughs. I'm a little skeptical anyone is there yet, but I really don't know if that's true. It is entirely possible that there are quantum computers today already that can break our existing cryptography. We just don't know, or at least I don't. Which leads me to cryptographic standards and an explanation of standards-based cryptography in general. In the US, cryptographic standards are set by NIST. These standards technically only apply to federal agencies and government contractors, and then only to the ones who aren't working in an intelligence. The intelligence agencies get to set their own standards, which are themselves classified and we don't get to know about. But even though the law only requires federal agencies to adhere to the standards, the impact on the market is tremendous. Government contractors and subcontractors must use them. The financial industry forces their adherence through contracts and other agreements, and those agreements percolate through and across much of the ecosystem. And then even companies that really don't need to adhere to the standards still have a strong preference for them, which makes sense. The standards guard against snake oil and poor choices and compatibility nightmares across systems. But these standards have also killed innovation in cryptography. Killed it. Lots of incredible technologies like, I know this is jargon, but stay with me, zero-knowledge proofs, attribute-based encryption, proxy re-encryption, identity-based encryption, secure multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption. All of these have struggled to find wide adoption, and in many cases, it's because they aren't blessed by NIST. And one more point, NIST sets the US standards, but it has an incredible impact on the rest of the world. There are other standards bodies, but in a commercial sense, the NIST standards are the one that end up dominating and mattering in the marketplace globally, not just the US market. If we look at what NIST has blessed when it comes to those symmetric algorithms, there have only been three. The Data Encryption Standard, or DES, was the first standard going back to 1977, and it stayed a standard until 2005, even though it was publicly broken in the mid-90s. Its replacement, Triple DES, was basically the same thing, but done three times, which had a surprisingly good impact on the security of the system, but was also outdated not long after it became a standard in 1999. The mostly, most widely used encryption in the world today, the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES, was adopted in 2001, and it's the mainstay to this day. These standards have lifespans of 20 to 30 years, maybe longer. We have no idea how, a how long AES will run for. It's a similar story in terms of longevity if we look at digital signatures, which I've mostly ignored in this presentation, but which are another important application of public key technology. Elliptic curve signatures, or ECDSA, are the newest of the standards, and they were adopted 23 years ago. For key exchange using public key cryptography, it's just RSA and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which, as far as I can tell, were first introduced as standards in 2006. And finally, it's worth noting that NIST doesn't just specify the algorithms, but also all of the mathematical parameters and constraints. So for elliptic curves, pretty much everything we use today was specified as standard in 2000. The first meaningful changes we've seen to this list will take effect next year as some new elliptic curves get the NIST blessing. This is more detail than you need, but I'm showing this to make an important point. We've had almost no meaningful change in the list of approved algorithms from NIST in over 20 years. Think about that. Despite blockchain and incredible breakthroughs in research, the standards landscape, and by extension the broad adoption of other algorithms, has been stunted. Until now. In 2016, NIST issued a call for participants in its post-quantum competition, which is designed to find the next generation of public key cryptography algorithms that are resistant to attacks by both quantum computers and by classical computers. The competi competition had its initial submissions in 2017, and as of last year has selected four winners 
with more winners yet to come. The multiple winners are required in order to better suit a variety of use cases. In other words, you know, an IoT, you might need one thing and a certain scenario over here, you might need something else. So they're selecting multiple winners. But importantly, though algorithms have been chosen as the winners, there are many details still to work out for those algorithms in order to standardize them and there are rounds of proposals and public feedback still to go before the standards are finalized. But this is huge because major change is in the works. After 20 plus years of largely static encryption standards, in the next couple of years, we'll about double the number, number of approved algorithms out of NIST. Now, there's something else that's kind of important to understand here, and that is that the U.S. government was pushing for these new standards, and also they've added first an executive order that then became a law called the Quantum Computing Cybersecurity Act. It was passed just last year, November 2022, and it mandates the adoption of post-quantum cryptography by federal agencies. In other words, the government is super freaked out about quantum computers, and they're trying to make change happen as quickly as possible, which does make you wonder what you don't know, right? One big worry encrypted data captured now can be held until quantum computers are capable of decrypting it. So you have to consider the data that I'm protecting now, if it should get intercepted or stolen in encrypted form, is it valuable enough for someone to hold on to until maybe, maybe some years from now, we don't know how many it can be decrypted. It's a big question. And those mandates kind of beg the question of what, what, some, what some folks in the federal government know that we don't. But regardless, as soon as things are standard, then people will have to change what they do. At least everyone in federal agencies will. Once these new algorithms are, are officially certified as standards, everyone, not just the mandated federal agencies, everyone will prioritize projects to adopt the new algorithms in a monumental, unprecedented global effort that will make Y2K look paltry by comparison. Here's the thing. Unlike Y2K, this isn't a one-time fix. These new standards are like the first hurricane in a season of hurricanes. And I think this is the thing that's least understood across the board. It's a surprise to pretty much everyone I've talked to about this stuff. It comes down to this. The post-quantum competition isn't a panacea. These are new algorithms built on foundations that are less well understood than our good old RSA and ECC, both of which are based on pretty understandable, fairly basic algebra. One of the new post-quantum computing algorithms, or PQC algorithms, has already been undermined by classical computers, requiring changes to it to combat the discovered weaknesses. And that's the thing. With new and less attacked algorithms come increased risk that new attacks will be found that defeat the intended security. This is likely to lead to an evolution of these standards and tweaks and changes in the coming years. It's also likely to lead to best practices around hybrid schemes that interweave classical and PQC algorithms as sort of a hedge against both. The best practices and best choices are going to change very soon. And then they're going to change again and again and again until ultimately they settle down. We're going to see more changes in cryptography and adoption of cryptography in the next five years than we have for the previous 25. That's a sure bet. I'd put money on it. Doesn't even matter how much. There's no question. Which begs this question though, what should organizations be doing now so that they're ready for the turmoil ahead and not caught up in fire drills? The single biggest thing I think they can do if they manage code that uses encryption is to get away from having cryptographic decisions of any sort in the code itself, to abstract away from algorithm and parameter and key size decisions so those things can be tweaked at any time without major projects and, and having to rewrite stuff. And this is the whole idea around crypto agility. It's a concept of coding once and expecting and even embracing change. It's a good idea even if you take away the quantum stuff because we could have major new discoveries that change the landscape of what we consider con secure at any time. It just makes sense. And no one needs to wait for standards to be baked first. The layer that abstracts everyone away from the details is the layer that needs to evolve as the standards do. But that can happen on its own trajectory. 
So look, full disclosure here, my company, IronCore, makes a crypto agile solution. Or rather, we make a data protection solution that has the important property of crypto agility. Okay, so that's what organizations should be doing, in my view at least, but what are they actually doing today? Well, at least some federal agencies are trying to get ahead of things by doing their research, kicking some tires, and drawing up inventories of their use of public key cryptography, drawing up plans for how to remediate it once standards are baked. And look, to be fair, these are important, and in fact, they are specifically required as deliverables following standardization. Unfortunately, we haven't seen anyone getting ahead of the game and beginning remediation by leveraging crypto agility and crypto agile solutions. We've seen people who care about crypto agility as they choose solutions and, and are, that are driven by other needs, but we haven't seen crypto agility like headline any deals as the reason for purchasing. And outside of government, my impression is that most companies, if they're aware of the coming changes at all, are waiting to see what happens, but otherwise ignoring the pending issues. Now, the market for crypto agility today, from where I sit, is all research and education. It's all tire kicking, some planning and little or no implementing, which is disappointing for us, right? These are made up numbers, by the way, I'm making a point. <laughs> so this is slightly tongue in cheek, but it's likely that demand will go from like zero to a thousand almost overnight when either the new standards are finalized or some sufficiently alarming news on quantum computing breakthroughs emerges. So what does the market care about? Or maybe more importantly, where do they say purchasing urgency around data security? Where, where do they have purchasing urgency around data security if it's not around this concept of crypto agility and quantum computers? In short, pets or privacy enhancing technologies. So what are pets? Well, they're technologies used to protect the privacy and security of personal data generally even from the holders of that data, while still allowing them to do whatever they need to with it. So for example, if a company holds on to its customer's birth date because it has some legal reason for needing to know which customers are minors or adults, there are technologies like zero knowledge proofs that can protect the birthday, excuse me, while still allowing a company to know who is a minor, even as time marches on and minors become adults. Adoption of pets today is being driven by evolving global regulations, specifically privacy protections and security requirements, and penalties for insufficient measures taken. These, this, this demand and this buildup has been growing over time. And relatedly, even more than security and privacy protection requirements, data sovereignty requirements are taking hold and gaining in strength. The most important of these for now comes out of the GDPR, which requires that EU citizen data only be transferred to or accessed from or by countries with equivalent privacy protections. But the U.S. doesn't give privacy protections to non-U.S. citizens in their laws, so which is why the U.S. keeps getting kicked off the adequacy list for countries allowed to hold the data of EU citizens. And we say sovereignty instead of residency these days, because it doesn't matter where the data is so much as whose laws govern access to that data and which governments can gain access to it directly. So any U.S. company doing business in Europe needs to answer the question of what happens if the U.S. government subpoenas data from them. If the U.S. doesn't have to work with counterparts in Europe to gain that access, then EU sovereignty is broken. I'm explaining this because it's probably one of the biggest drivers in the market right now, and it's responsible for the increasing popularity of pets, at least in part. Now, one approach to dealing with data sovereignty is what I'll call application layer encryption. This is where data is encrypted before it's sent to the data store. So anyone who gains access to that store or compromises infrastructure sees only garbage data. We refer to this as ALE, and it differs from standard infrastructure level encryption and transparent disk encryption approaches that only really protect data when a machine is off or a hard drive is taken out of a computer. Whereas wherever the data is and whoever has access to it, if the key is held by an entity in the EU, by an EU entity in the EU, let's say, then a subpoena for the data will require cooperation with the EU authorities to make sense of the otherwise random bits. Or 
they might have to compel the software manufacturer to change their code to undermine the security, which is something that's been shown to be a non-starter in the US, at least so far. ALE then gets paired with data in use encryption, which is sometimes referred to in its two main categories, confidential computing and homomorphic encryption. Regardless, the idea is that you can operate on the data as needed. You can find it, you can sort it, you can aggregate it, you can calculate over it or whatever. You can do all of that without leaking information about the data or what's being requested. But you can only do these things if and only if you have the proper key, which is a powerful way to be able to use hosted solutions without the hosting provider having access to the data, even while they can offer value on top of that data. And in this broader space, there's a new niche forming that's incredibly interesting. It's the niche where today we're seeing the greatest urgency by far, and that's around new AI systems and their data. These are new projects with new data, new problems. With legacy data and traditional databases, there's a certain inertia and disinclination to change how things work. The prospect of better security is weighed against the risks for something breaking in their infrastructure or whatever. But with AI, for most companies, there are all new systems and data involved, and so the need to get privacy and security right from the start is very strong. According to Gartner, more than half of AI projects never make it to production because of security and privacy issues. Basically, everyone wants to adopt AI right now, but they're blocked, or they're blocked from doing AI projects around their most valuable data, the confidential, personal, and private data. So the AI chatbots that just summarize public web pages are proliferating while the real value of these systems is languishing. But the opportunity here is unique because the usual reluctance to change established systems isn't part of the equation. Let me take you a click deeper for just a minute. We've had machine learning for a long time now. I've personally overseen numerous projects that use it. But lately, something has changed. Where before, the model and its training set was the focus of privacy and security concerns. Everyone built their own models. 90% of a project was spent just building and testing and then tweaking and rebuilding and retesting and tweaking and all the time was spent on the model. These days, we're getting these commercial and open source models that are much bigger and they're more general and they're shared. They're like a public utility that companies use. Even when people are building their own models, their use cases have expanded and the complexity has changed and like where the focus of the intellectual property is has evolved into new elements. Models are there to be used, and when you use them, you often need to store their impressions of their inputs. These are the inferences they make in kind of high definition. And we put this in what we might term AI's long-term memory, which comes in the form of something called a vector embedding, or an ML or an AI embedding. This is where all the sensitive data is shifting to. Lots of solutions, including ours, can protect the training data, but these vector embeddings haven't been used much until now. You could think of them as functioning much like your memory and mind does. So for example, right now we're processing a stream of audible and, and visual data. Our brains are taking all that input and interpreting it and picking out the embedded meanings, which is what we retain in our memories. When we regurgitate what we see in here, we do it in our own words, oriented around the most important bits, and it's the same with AI systems. If we feed a large language model some sensitive strategic company plan, it'll reduce it to a series of vectors, which are just basically numbers that represent the meaning of the input. We could later ask a generative AI to recreate the original document, and it could do so with high precision, precision, thematically, in its own words. So the memories are equivalent to the inputs, but they don't retain the exact original input. If Just the same, if the input is sensitive or regulated, then so is the embedding. And this AI memory, it gets stored in this new class of storage called a vector database, which is this exploding segment right now. Few people yet have these databases in their infrastructure, but soon everyone will because they're needed for a lot of popular use, use cases today, including similarity search, like semantic search, which is based on query meaning and image search, but also for recommendation engines, facial recognition, voice recognition, and so on and so forth. Encrypting the data before sending it to the database allows you to leverage the data as normal if and only if you have the key, 
again, data and use encryption, but applied to this new class of data. You can host the data anywhere with any company, regardless of international borders or whatever, to take advantage of fast moving technologies in the best available, quickest to use, most performant, whatever technologies without security and privacy being a blocker. Okay, so to summarize what we talked about today, one, quantum computers will shred much of today's encryption. Maybe we have 10 years or maybe they already can in a secret lab. I really don't know and it may not even matter. Two, independent of quantum computer capabilities, new standards are coming to cryptography soon. And these will create churn we haven't seen in over 20 years. Three, crypto agile solutions are the smart way to ride out the churn and they can be adopted today, right now. But the market doesn't yet value these solutions and will likely need some kind of catalyst like the adoption of the new standards from the PQC. Four, the market is generally leaning into pets as a way to alleviate privacy, security, and data sovereignty pressures around the globe. But there's resistance when changing mature and established software. Five, new AI capabilities have created a new gold rush adding enormous value to data and, and capabilities to apps. But security and privacy issues are holding projects back. And six, pets for AI data are emerging to solve this problem and the barriers to adoption for this newish class of data are much lower than for the traditional data that companies hold. And because I'm doing this for YouTube, I'm afraid I don't, won't be taking your questions except in the comments, but feel free to leave questions and, and comments and thoughts uh, down below. Tell me what I got wrong or got right or uh, what you'd like to see more of. Thanks for your time today.